I've been doing this for 13 years, and there have been some magic panels at magic moments, but I can really say that Mar uh, Marjo and all of the World Economic Forum have really outdone themselves with this panel, uh, which with the storyline of our politics, our economics, and our finance at the moment uh, could not be better timed. Uh, let me start by making a few brief comments on our panelists, and then I want to get to our three-hour discussion. Um, we have a panelist uh, today who understands the mathematics of the great distortion, the responsibility of trying to find an actuarial assumption and trying to match the obligations of the future. Uh, we have a panelist today with profound responsibilities for the long-term matching of obligations of, of this strange word insurance, which is from another century uh, and is changing with the technology of a day at light speed. We have a panelist today who's an absolute crucible of the new finance, its linkage to regulation, its linkage to our politics, and, and particularly our world politics, um, looking at the responsibility of making ratios and making it every 90 days. If you don't make it every 90 days, the world falls apart. We have a panelist who provides us with a terrific historical template. Uh, who has been committed to uh, acquiring for the United States of America different pieces of our heritage and our history and possibly understands the 1930s like no one in the room uh, and certainly the political moment that we're in worldwide, the many moments. And finally, we have a panelist who, full disclosure, has written my book of the year with a, a great hat tip to Sebastian Malaby. Uh, and Professor Rogoff, who has the worst ratings on Amazon I've ever seen. His book is just flat out courageous, and it has had international uh, response and debate. So let's get right to it. Uh, I guess the future of finance is about the how of the future, the what of the future, the strategies, and we too often forget, particularly in this valley, the tactics that will be required, the short term to get to the strategic uh, long term. And Richards, uh, you understand the great distortion. You understand how the bond market as a measure of this crisis and of this distortion has distorted all of finance. Can you say all clear on the great distortion? Do we begin this seminar? Do we begin this Davos saying that we're through the negative rates and through the great distortion of the last eight years? I think we've passed the inflection point. I mean, st clearly still in bond markets, there's a lot of distortion is still in there. But I think the thing that was crystal clear in uh, 2016 was the shift in the way that central banks themselves, central bankers themselves, were looking at what monetary policy could do. I mean, I think it's a really interesting chart. If you look at um, Janet Yellen's statements, at the start of the year, she'd never mentioned the word fiscal in her press comments once. By the time we get to the end of the year in her last press conference, she mentioned the word, word fiscal 20 times. And I think that is very symptomatic of the fact that central banks have realized that this primacy of their independence away from government actually wasn't sufficient. You need to have fiscal and monetary policy working together. And that's what bond markets, I think, began to react to through 2016, this realization we need a, a new framework for thinking about how we transmit monetary policy through to the real economy. And that's how we're going to adapt to this. And that's why we're at the end of this 30-year period of, of unidirectional bond markets. Uh, David Rubenstein, I, I haven't we, we go step by step here. We go from thought to thought. There's no real structure to this before we get to your good questions. Full disclosure, uh, Dr. Weber, I'll be starting with you on the questions, so get ready. Uh, but uh, David Rubenstein, I believe we have a fiscal debate and we have a moment. Ian Bremer had the best photo out on social yesterday of the one left standing Chancellor Merkel. Is it fiscal policy to the rescue in 2017 that sets the template for a nor more normal finance? Well, let me just talk about the United States for a moment. In the United States, for the last six years or so, it's been very difficult to get fiscal policy because the Congress and the President were not really uh, in sync, and so therefore no major legislation dealing with taxes was really going to be uh, passed by the Congress. 
Now we have a Republican Congress and a Republican President, and the theory is that there should be some legislation that will deal with fiscal policy and significant fis fiscal policy, significant tax cuts, and, a way, uh, and major changes in the way uh, we tax uh, our corporations and our, and our individuals in the United States. If that can get implemented, then yes, there will be uh, a significant fiscal stimulus in the United States, I believe. Monetary policy will not be as significant as it was. On the other hand, uh, monetary policy is going to have a factor, be, uh, be a factor because it's likely that the Fed will uh, continue to increase interest rates a bit. And so you'll have an interesting uh, anomaly here. You're going to have a fiscal policy that is controlled by the Republicans and a uh, monetary policy that's really being made by Democrats who are largely uh, composed of the, uh, the Fed or control the Fed. So we'll see how that works. But right now, I think the Congress is likely to pass some significant legislation in the fiscal area, tax area. But if, if you go by the George W. Bush administration or the Ronald Reagan administration, when they were trying to get significant tax legislation through, it takes roughly nine to 10 months to get it done. So nothing is going to happen overnight. And mm -hmm. as we probably know, the presidents of the United States don't have as much impact on tax legislation as the Congress does. So while the president will say, here's what I would like to do, the devil's in the details in tax policy. So it's going to take a long well, time before we really know what the fiscal changes are going to be. The devil may be in the tweet. We'll have to see what Mr. Trump says today as we move to the inauguration. Mario Greco, uh, to get back to the finance end of it, and part of what Mr. Rubenstein was speaking of is this idea of a change template of regulation. Do you look for a finance of 2017 that will be a difference in regulation for Zurich, and what will that difference be? Uh, the big issue that we're facing is integration of capital rules. Capital rules are very different uh, in Europe, U.S., Asia. Of course, uh, we favor um, in um, a standardization of capital rules across the continents, but I think this is going to be very unlikely and very difficult to achieve. And so capital arbitrage or uh, looking for the best capital rules will remain um, a kind of game that uh, Americans, uh, Europeans, and Asians will think about playing. Which institution do you look for to, which government institution do you look for to be most commonsensical about the future of finance? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> it's too early in the morning for difficult questions, but I'll go with it. <laughs> is, there, is there one institution in particular that you're focused on? Um, I mean, not really. The, the issue we have is, as insurance companies that uh, the regulators uh, tend to rule uh, or have a memory for having ruled banks. And they tend to consider insurance companies as banks, which we're not. And so the uh, extension to insurance company of banking rules fails to understand the riskiness of what we do. Uh, we um, live in a world where we accept liabilities from customers and we match assets uh, to the liabilities and we run uh, a quite a good match of assets and liabilities over a longer period of mm -hmm. times. Banks don't do that, and this is something that we're st still struggling to have the regulators understand. And this explains uh, the issues that we had in Europe on solvency too, which has been completely counter-cyclical. Um, capital regulation did not help in the past mm -hmm. years getting Europe outside of the uh, economical crisis and explains also the struggle that we're having right. in getting an aligned system worldwide. John Cryan, uh, you have had an eventful uh, set of years with Deutsche Bank. You begin a new year. There has to be a vision for the future of finance and how large banks fold into that. Mm -hmm. Not where will you be this year. Where is the future of big banks in five years? Well, we are placing our, uh, our bets on technology. Um, we're not sure that the fundamental nature of products will change much, although regulation tends to impact that. Um, we don't think that the demands of our clients and counterparts will change too much. Um, so it's the delivery mechanism. And, um, and that will help us protect ourselves. We can use technology to improve our own controls. We can use technology to improve our efficiency. And then we can use technology to, uh, to improve the customer service. Within the investment that you have to make is the idea of a new banking. Is it banking as it's been, or is the future of finance a new banking? 
that will be radically different? Um, it would be different, but if we take the, the narrow definition of banking, we're regulated to take deposits, and that regulation provides some form of protection of the status quo. It doesn't defend us against newcomers, mm -hmm. but it does embody the status quo, and everything regulated tends to, mm -hmm. to continue as it is. Regulation's not, not generally a facilitator of mm. change. So against the regulation, we try to be innovative. Innovation in financial services has been frowned upon for a decade or so for justifiable reasons. It didn't, it didn't serve society as well as it might have done uh, 10 years ago. But we haven't been innovative other than in delivery channels. So I think technology is the key. Right. In the next five years. In the last half hour of this uh, of this panel, we'll really dive into the technology. And Ken Rogoff, finally, uh, to you, uh, we talk about strategies, but then we talk about uh, the tactical surprises we saw with India and their adjustments to their cash regime. I'll call it. Uh, wh what have you learned about innovation when you look at the curse of cash and you look at uh, experimental modes and such. What have you learned in the last six months that sets us up for the future of finance? Not specifically in India, but just on the different experiments out there. Well, there's a phenomenal amount of innovation in finance at the moment. It's sort of hard to know what direction it will take. A lot of it is being developed in the private sector. If you look at the long history of money, the private sector is often the innovator from standardized coinage to paper currency. Uh, to whatever we have in the future. But um, certainly central banks are looking hard at these ideas. Uh, I think it's pretty likely we'll start to have central bank digital currencies in the next 20 years, if not the next five. They have digital currencies already. Um, Deutsche Bank holds its reserves electronically at the central bank. But this will get extended to a much broader group. And that may sound you know, just like a little technical thing, but it has profound implications for disintermediation of the system, uh, people being able directly to go to the central bank instead of through banks, the government, to fund itself. And then more broadly in the private sector, these innovations provide ways to do legal contracts, ways for banks to transact with each other without going through a third party. It's a, it's a very exciting time in innovation. But I have a feeling the regulators are probably way behind what's going on. David, please comment on the parallels here. I think of Mellon in the 1930s and this idea of combination is the end result of this future of finance, that there's simply fewer players involved. And do you assume that that will occur sooner rather than later? Well, actually, uh, what's happened is uh, the number of banks in the United States has consolidated after the Great Recession and other things. We have relatively fewer major banks than we used to have. And that phenomenon occurred in the 1930s as well as banks consolidated. Uh, now what you're finding is that banks are important, but you have financial service companies that are not banks that are playing an increasingly important role in the financial service industry. The so-called fintech revolution has really revolutionized uh, banks as well as uh, other providers of financial services. So for example, uh, today many people are paying their uh, their bills through mobile payments through their telephones, and they're not necessarily going through sending checks to banks to, to, to do things like that. And, and China and India are leading the way. Uh, interestingly, while the United States considers itself a financial uh, center and also a, a center of technology uh, revolution, uh, the revolution that's really occurring in financial services is occurring in, in emerging markets, China and India, mm -hmm. where they're bypassing some of the things that we, we have in the United States because they're really going from an emerging market to a financial tech revolution. And therefore, you will, you'll find many more people comfortable with using mobile payments on, on, uh, in China and India than you do in the United States, much, much higher percentage. And you're also going to see enormous amounts of other uh, ways that people are going to get around the traditional banking system by uh, doing things that banks uh, do for them historically, but now uh, non-regulated institutions can do it. And the whole fin financial tech revolution has seen enormous amounts of money coming into this space. So right now, uh, you're, you're seeing uh, probably five times as much money is going to the financial tech companies as uh, was five years, as about five years ago, five times as much has come in. And it's projected that probably it'll increase by about 50% per annum over the next 10 years, because you see so much uh, uh, opportunity to make money for the investors, but also it's really revolutionized the way people deal with banks and right. also deal with money. 
So after that briefing, John Cryan, what is the to-do list for a, a major bank? How do you pull in that technological innovation? Uh, I had a panel here two, three years ago on the same theme, ever more so now. How do you pull in that institution, uh, that, that innovation to slower, stodgy, developed economy, banking and finance? Um, well, we've taken a number of approaches. Um, one, is, one is to work with it. Um, but it's a slight diff distance, so that we're not, we, we are a multinational corporation. That's not an institution at which all young people aspire to, to work these days. So we find newer ways of, of working, particularly with younger people. They want a different employment contract than a simple employer-employee relationship. Um, they're much more fluid. And, uh, and they want sometimes some equity, so we work with them as, as a third party, but with some degree of exclusivity. And we can capture the intellectual property without necessarily formally employing the individual. And we've set up different, we have three or four different approaches to that. We're not sure we necessarily always have the right idea. Mm -hmm. It varies from country to country too, because employment law varies. But in Germany, we've, uh, we've two or three different approaches to how we deal with, with entrepreneurs and innovators. Do you just assume a consolidation? We see moment to moment in the future of finance, everyone's working on the expense side of the income statement. That can only go so far, and then do we see consolidation, whether it's in your banking or Anne and Mario's uh, more portfolio-based products? Um, I do, and I agree with you that there's, there's pressure on expense, but there's also a lot of pressure on improving controls. Mm. Um, um, and the product innovation, and I stress product innovation, there have been plenty of other innovations, and, and digital currency is one of them. But the products haven't fundamentally changed because they tend to be regulated, and they're more and more regulated. So as regulation becomes uh, more granular, mm -hmm. um, inst traditional institutions tend to be less innovative, and we're looking elsewhere for disruptors. Um, are, you, are you optimistic on that, Ken, within your travels? Are you optimistic that what David talks about, a third world lead in these innovations can come over to the more developed economy banking? Well, I mean, certainly there are great innovations going on in India and China in mm -hmm. addition to the United States. But, <clears throat> I mean, I, you know, there's sort of a question how to tame the whole thing. Their financial sectors are a mess in some ways that provides an opportunity for these disruptors. For example, internet lending is just huge in China because there's so much regulation on mm -hmm. the banks. Um, there's a reason Bitcoin's so popular in China because there's so many capital controls Can and so Bitcoin many regulations. I, I think it's more of a substitute for credit cards and debit cards to make a long story short, but you know, it's just, they circumvent regulation. So there's a big demand for that mm -hmm. in India and China. Mario, how do you adapt to this? I mean, you're on a completely different wing of it from some of our panelists today. How do you adapt and adjust to innovation, or do you just hide in Zurich? Um, so first of all, innovation for us uh, is uh, a revolution with the customers, so because uh, through technology, through innovation, we can get in touch with the customer at every moment. So connectivity, it will really change the relationship between consumers and insurance companies. Uh, this is a great revolution, and uh, it changes completely the products and services that we can offer to customers. Now, in order to do that, uh, uh, we do very similar things to what uh, Jenna said. So, so we um, partially invest directly in technologies, and part partially we outsource it to, to um, partners uh, who work with us on different schemes. Mario, we've got a microphone trouble. They want, they want you amplified. Should I repeat it? That's better. Okay. Thanks. No, 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 go ahead, please, continue, <laughs> continue. No, so uh, we work on uh, both the systems. Uh, we outsource technology to providers, uh, and we work together with partners who have schemes uh, uh, which incentivize them with us. Uh, but, but as I said before, and I don't know if it was heard, that, that the big game is the connectivity with the customers, so which allows us to mm -hmm. redefine the product and the services that we offer to customers and makes, uh, finally, insurance immediately available to customers. 
If I could, could Please, I David. Uh, to make it simple for everybody to understand, at least I will try to make it simple, you have the banks, the insurance companies, the existing financial institutions we're all familiar with. They are innovating, and a lot of the fintech revolution is making them, uh, making possible for them to provide their services more efficiently and, and, uh, and, and uh, more cheaply. Uh, then you have another fintech revolution, which is trying to disrupt completely the banks and the insurance companies and say, we have a whole new way of doing things. It's unclear which is going to uh, ultimately prevail. Will the banks be revolutionized and changed, but there'll still be banks and insurance companies that people are familiar with, but they'll just be much more user-friendly and, and, and cheaper? Or will new organizations like Alipay, which is an organization in China that provides enormous opportunity for people to pay uh, uh, their bills through, through uh, that system, which is not really regulated. And will that system prevail over the dis existing financial mm -hmm. institutions, banks, insurance companies? We don't know. But both are moving forward at exponential rates of change because there's a lot of demand by customers, younger right. people particularly, for innovation, for new technology. I don't know today whether the banks, insurance companies, or the existing regulation uh, reg, uh, reg, uh, organizations will prevail, or whether these new organizations we haven't even heard of will prevail five or ten years from now. Mm -hmm. But clearly there's a revolution going on both yeah. directions. Ann Richards? I think it's quite helpful to, to break down the financial system in this way and to think about two main bits of it. There is, first of all, the plumbing bit, which is the stuff that connects. So if you think of it in that sense. And then there is the data bit, which is the, if you think of the plumbing bit as the pipes and the data as the water that flows through the pipes, we have increasingly a global set of pipes in which a lot of both traditional, conventional companies and new starters are working at different bits of that pipe. There's stuff that's going on in the, dealing with the quality of the water, which is things like the stuff that Google does or Facebook to find out how you and I interact with the plumbing. So there's two different bits of it that are going on here. I think one of our big challenges is not so much who is involved in improving which bit, whether it's the plumbing or whether it's the, it's the water. It's that regulators break down the system pretty much into national chunks. And actually, to the, to the consumer, to the people in this room, to our clients, to our customers, they view it as just one ubiquitous set. And I think we've got a really interesting challenge going on but, and tension between what regulators are trying to do at a micro level and a national level, and actually what the system and what the individuals who interact with that system want, which is a much more global and fluid system. And I think that's mm. the tension that we'll see gradually resolve itself over the next five years. Well, the question you have is, are consumers better off with the fintech revolution? And presumably, they will be eventually. Um, is society better off? The, the theory is probably that society will be better off with these changes. And then two other questions that are raised are, are were regulators going to be able to keep up with all these changes? And, sec and last, uh, will security be able to keep up with this? In other words, with all this technology coming along, are we going to be able to make these things secure? Uh, and will the regulators be able to keep up with all these changes? And nobody knows the answers to all these things, and they're struggling with them right, right. now. But the issue, Ken, help us here with an Act 10. Let's pretend we're with Q in, in the acclaimed freshman class at Harvard. Does this drive us towards perfect competition within the future of finance, where margins are taken away from Mr. Cry and Ms. Richards and... Uh, Mr. Greco, do the margins evaporate? Well, first starting with it, a lot of it revolves around regulation. And of course, always in finance, the private sector innovates, the regulators take time to catch up, the euro market developed that way. The private sector looks for where it's not regulated, goes to those paths. But the I do think the regulators are going to come in everywhere. I mean, sort of what I mentioned earlier in China with the internet lending, that's, a, that's an extreme version. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the Chinese authorities don't know that that's going on. They're kind of seeing how it works. And I think that's true also if you look at the United States and Europe. They don't, they're nervous, but still, as long as these alternative mechanisms are, are kind of small, they let it go on. But eventually, they need to come in and regulate it. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, just as we saw in, you know, for example, book selling, you know, there's a shift in, you know, where the centers are. That could happen over the future. I don't think it'll unfold that quickly because I think if this unregulated sector got very big, let's face it, some problem would happen. Right. There'd be a hue and cry for regulation. So I think uh, it's, it's a balance between innovation and regulation. John Crane, does the digital world just compete away profits if you go down any given income statement? Does, 
Do, the, do you just assume margins are competed away? Very often, yes. Yeah. Yes. You have to give longer answers than that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, that, that, that can be the result of it. And very often we, for example, it's very interesting, we, we meet a lot of fintechs, and they'll come in and they'll... Um, they'll lecture you. For, yeah, they will, yeah. <laughs> For example, I know in trade finance, they'll say, this is, there's lots of inefficiency and friction in trade finance. We can take it all out. And then you look at what they're proposing, and what you do is you take out all the profit as well. So you could do what they suggest, but it wouldn't remunerate them. And it, would, it, it wouldn't address the fact that it takes a long time to ship something from A to B, physically. Mm -hmm. And so there, are, there is time value. And they strip out a lot of um, that friction. And sometimes it's uh, artificially created friction just to create a profit. So that's, um, that's an improvement in the service. But when it's, uh, when it's somebody actually delivering uh, credit over a period of time, there's no substitute for, for what we do. And there's, there, are, there are different ways of delivering it. You can deliver it in a digital fashion, but it's still, it's still well, extending if, credit. If we get a crying universe, Mario Greco, how do the regulators adapt? Do they become the bastion of profit protection for old banking and old finance? I think what they're doing today is they're moving more and more toward customers' protection, um, which is fair in its right. Um, but I want to stress what Anne said before. Uh, the issue, I think, is that consumers uh, and companies are becoming more and more multinational, and consumers also travel and move around the world. The regulators tend to look at borders and tend to regulate on a national basis. And this inconsistency is, uh, um, is slowing down or is creating hurdles in really following the pace of innovation through the world. And this is something that should be more and more considered in the future. Do, David, do you see a new regime of regulation with the populism that we have today? I mean, you've been very US centric in your conversation, but I go back to the Bremer photograph of yesterday. Yeah. It was Regulators are not famous for um, saying, well, there's nothing really to regulate, and we just maybe should just go home and find yeah, another job. It's so happen. it's not likely that, they'll, that they won't find something to regulate. Uh, but th whether they can keep up with the changes, I'm not sure. I'm just curious, though, the people here, uh, how many people here are still writing checks? Very few. How many people are banking online? Very many. How many people have been in a bank in the last year? <laughs> and people haven't been in a bank in the last year? Okay, so um, you know, generally, we I find a divide between younger people and maybe people who are a little bit older uh, than, let's say, 30 years old. The younger people, they haven't been in a bank. They are not. They don't know what a. Ch I have three children who are in their 20s and 30s. I don't think they've ever written a check. They don't write checks because everything's online. Um, I'm I'm a last adopter, so I'm always writing checks. But but I'm not the best fintech probably a person, but the younger generation just doesn't understand what some of us are really doing by writing checks, visiting banks, and, 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 and things like that. And this revolution, I think, is probably best understood by, by younger people. When you talk to the younger people of what they want out of financial services, it's much different than what my generation really wanted. Is it generational, Ann Richards? I, I, I have had a number of senior bankers tell me they completely missed how fossils would pick up on digital banking. Well, I think Facebook's fastest growing cohort is people age around about 50. So, you know, I think, there is, yeah. I think there, is a, there is a late adopter thing which goes on. I think you have to look at the curves. So mm -hmm. I think there is a correlation with age, but I don't, it's not a, it's, you know, I think it, it's broader than that. People get there. My 86-year-old father uses an iPad and email to communicate with us because he's so deaf. So it's fantastic um, in that sense. But I think what we are inching towards, and I don't think any regulator has really got their head around this yet, is the fact that I think data regulation and financial regulation are <coughs> converging more and more. And we have no setup as yet which really brings the two of those together. But if you think about the repository of information, the more we touch the customer, the more information we collate and hold about buying preferences, about risk appetite, about what you did yesterday, about what you do tomorrow, what you're searching on the internet. The more that gets held within no. a financial world, the more that touches data protection. And data regulation and financial regulation, in my view, ultimately are overlapping strongly and are converging. With what you hear at it, 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 M&G, can you, can you be overweight financials? I don't mean within a tactical yeah. sense, but is it, is it a, a sector of opportunity for investment? 
The, the answer to that is clearly yes, but it is also, I think, one of the sectors that is that we look at most closely because the potential for the kind of sidewinder missile to hit it, whether that comes from prudential regulation, whether that comes from consumer um, facing regulation, whether that comes from, you know, Alibaba was mentioned, from an, an unexpected entrant. And because of this convergence with data, whether it comes with somebody with a big cash rich balance sheet from right outside the financial <laughs> sector, you know, the potential for disruption is absolutely live and it could come from anywhere. But that doesn't mean it's not investable. An enormous amount of money is going into this sector. Uh, right, remember, 20% of the world's GDP is the financial service industry. So it's a large part of the global economy. And therefore, you know, there's a lot of uh, opportunity there. And you're seeing enormous amounts of venture capital money um, and also private equity money going into the sector. Probably it's the fastest growing uh, area of technology that I see right now, financial uh, services. Mm -hmm. In terms of Alipay, uh, just think about this. Last year, I believe it was, they had 437 million customers. Uh, they have more clients than any financial institution in, in, uh, than any bank in China. And you're going to see this more and more in the emerging markets where people who are providing payment services are now actually are, are becoming more important in the economy of a, of a country than the banks have traditionally been. And so and more and more you're going to see people moving away from banking, traditional banking services and, and regulated services right. because they're probably more expensive and the banks have to, to adapt to that. Ken, do we need cash for all of this chit chat? Or does cash go away? A, a, a short answer is I think we need a physical currency probably forever, uh, but we would be wise to have a lot less of it, particularly large denomination notes. I want to pick up on something Ann said. I think it's a very deep problem with the whole, it's not just financial, fintech, but the whole data management, privacy, what information are people allowed to have, what information are people allowed to to share. Now, you know, economists sometimes look at this and say it's fantastic. We'll have all this ability to write really complex contracts that we didn't use to be able to write. Uh, my colleague Oliver Hart won the Nobel Prize this year, you know, for showing how hard it was to deal with situations where you can't have complete contracts. He uses the example of when I had my house built. I mean, how could I possibly think of everything that would go wrong, you know, and put it in a contract? How do I think about those things? But this new world where we can see everything you do and say, there is the potential to do that but, and give you better services more cheaply in, in anything, including financial services. But their profound privacy power issues it is really a, a, even bigger than the question of this panel, a big issue of the next couple decades. Before we get to questions, John Cryan, uh, I believe we have what we're calling daily somewhat incorrectly, the Trump reflation. And I put up a chart that shows US full faith and credit 210 spread. And we've come up off the election. And now we've up down to a real point of tension where we're going to see which way uh, this breaks. How important is it for strategic finance in the future to have a normal market? Can all of this talk happen within the low interest rate environment we're in right now? Or by definition, with or even before, do you have to have normalcy within the interest rate market? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are two aspects to normalcy. Um, one is interest rates, and there's never been a right interest rate. They vary all the time. It's been tough, and we've, in the banking sector, all been a bit vocal about very low and negative interest rates, mm -hmm. because they have consequences that were not as well thought through before they were imposed as they might have been sometimes. But low interest rates effectively transfer value from savers to, to borrowers. And that's their intent, to stoke economic development. I think where we, we in the banking sector, and I look more at our securities and uh, derivatives brokerage, where we find more distortion and lack of normalcy would be in government intervention in bond buying, for example. Mm -hmm. Because that deprives us of clean market price discovery. And once the pricing basis, a US Treasury, which is the fundamental pricing basis for, for most securities, is distorted by government, um, deliberate government buying, then we distort all asset prices. And then we don't have a proper capital allocation. So that, that I think, is the, the distortion and the normalcy that, that um, the markets, I think, would benefit from being returned. 
Ken, whether you look at central bank uh, uh, balance sheets or you look at them as a percent of their GDP, and there's a number of ways to look at this, do we just need to clear those balance sheets of the financial crisis to get back to rate normalcy, or can we do it? Can we have both? Can we have it uh, both ways? Can we get back to normalcy while the banks ever so slowly unwind all that ownership? Well, there has been this overwhelming drive towards safe assets that's been going on for a long time that's on interest rates that central banks really have very little to do with. I know most people think central banks are causing this, but it's really saving in China, Germany, mm -hmm. Japan, the low level of investment. And by the way, I do think in the United States this will change over the next couple of years. If Donald Trump brings back nothing else, it'll be risk into the bond market that'll eventually get uh, priced in. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I do think there are better ways to deal with things if it happens again in 20 years. And I talk about this in my book. Um, I want to be cautious. You know, I don't look at the current situation, but about how we could have effective negative interest rate right. policy in a crisis, not all the time. And then you'd have price discovery. But that's not a normal thing. You would certainly like to see positive levels of interest rates across the board mm -hmm. uh, in a, in a well-functioning system. The back half of Professor Rodoff's book is on negative rates. Mark Greco, there's, there's negative rates that we have now. And maybe with a little bit of courage, we have more negative rates to spur uh, a rebound or reflation, if you would. Marvin Goodfriend of Jackson Hole talked about substantially more negative rates. Can you have a future of finance, given the fear out there that someday we may implement draconian negative rates? No, please. I mean, as an insurance company, we felt we survived to these negative rates, which we never thought we will or the industry will. And now we need to have uh, normal rates back into the market. And we look forward to have some risks coming uh, back into the play and to have less distortion in uh, the bond prices. Um, the negative rates take us away from choices and from product options and uh, make the life also of the consumers incredibly difficult, as it is also for banks. So hopefully this, uh, right. and we're looking forward to see that uh, moving away. Ken, please. I just wanted to add, if the ECB were to unwind its quantitative easing right now, we'd have a collapse of the Eurozone. So it's not something that could Do be done. Do you agree, Mr. Crane? A collapse of the ECB. Collapse of the Eurozone. The Eurozone. You missed it down here. Sorry, if, we, if, we got, if the ECB sold all its Italian bonds and Spanish bonds, unwound its balance sheet. Um, well, we'd have chaos in the bond markets because I'm not sure there, there would be enough um, immediate support to mm -hmm. buy what the ECB has bought. I'm not sure it necessarily means that the, uh, the Eurozone collapses, but prices would fall a lot. It, it shows the tension points here away from talk about innovation and technology. There's the market vigilantes each and every day. We will do questions. Please identify who you are here at the World Economic Forum. Uh, and uh, please point it in short questions, but we must have and begin with perhaps an observation and question from Dr. Weber, please. Can I speak like this? Am I heard? I, I believe you're heard, or do we need it? Marjo, can we get a mic over here, please, sir? Over here, Dr. Weber. Thank you, Tom. And, um, just one observation may be added. You talked a lot about banking and innovation. What was missing a bit was the capital market. And uh, I think we do see that increasingly capital markets will play a much bigger role. Uh, banking disintermediation is going to happen. The example that we heard about the U.S. still writing checks, that has basically bypassed 50 years of financial innovation on how we do delivery of money. And it shows you one thing. The speed of financial innovation is much less driven by the suppliers of that innovation, but by the acceptance of consumers to adapt it. And so I'm with John, who probably doesn't see a lot of changes in what we do day to day on our retail side and how we do corporate credit. But if you go to the capital market side, one of the problems of the last crisis was excessive innovation and complexity. And that part of markets, capital markets, has been really pulled back and is on the leash for after the crisis it will re-emerge. And I think capital market innovation 
is going to be the key driver in emerging markets. I don't think China will go the same way as Europe or as the US. If you get the same market capitalization in China that you have in the United States, it just tells you how big bond markets, equity markets, and property markets will grow in China as they emerge. So my hope is not that uh, the banking side right. will grow, but it's the capital markets. David, so are I want we prepared you, for that? David, I want you and John to jump into this. David, uh, my answer to this, when I look at the shock to the capital markets, is transactions that lead to combinations. Are nations ready for their banks to combine across borders or within a nation? Well, clearly, um, some nations regard it as important to have a major bank. So I think it's unlikely, for example, that Deutsche Bank is going to be a, allowed by the German regulators to be bought by somebody that's not German. And so I think it's probably true that most countries want to have at least one major bank. And I don't think you're going to see uh, the French regulators allowing some of the major French banks, for example, to be bought by uh, non-French entities. So there's th that nationalistic feeling is still going to be around for a while. But I, I do think we, we should rec recognize that, that the large banks, um, although we say that we don't want them to be too big and, and therefore uh, too dangerous, they are getting bigger and, and more powerful than I think they were before the financial crisis as we've consolidated the banks. And so I, I do think the banks, uh, I don't know whether they're too big to fail or not, but I think they're much more significant than they were before the financial crisis because we've consolidated and given much bigger balance sheets to the banks than they had before. John, with great respect for the challenges that you face, mm -hmm. how do you find too big to fail in the future of finance? Um, I think too big to fail, it's, a, it's a, the phrase that was normally used. Um, I think a better formulation was always too complicated to manage successfully. Dr. Weber just mentioned, yes. Yeah. Um, and it was that, it was, it's not so much size. If all we did was take deposits and by US treasuries with those deposit monies, we could be really very big. Um, we'd have a lot of concentration on one asset, but we could be really very big and relatively simple. I think we proliferated the markets in which we operated, the products we offered in those markets, and the types of customers we tried to serve. And we didn't always control ourselves as well as we should have done. And there was a lot of, um, it was the zeitgeist, it was, there was a lot of um, focus on growth, market share gains, um, cross-border acquisitions, which ultimately didn't add value, but added complexity. And I use this word a lot, zeitgeist. What will be the zeitgeist of modern banking? Well, we're regulated to take deposits, to, be very, to, to give a sort of technical answer to that. And, um, and therefore, it's more fun for people who don't take deposits to, to play in other mm -hmm. fora of financial services where they're less tightly regulated. Now, that's, that's partly why banks um, extended their remit. I mean, one of our most valuable businesses would be our asset management business. It's you know, three quarters of a trillion dollars of, of assets we manage. No one ever calls it into question. Obviously, it runs large operational risk. It's not as fun. It's, it's not as fun. It's a very stable source of earnings. We like it. Um, there are parts of our business, though, that did take sizable concentrated risks. And we missed out on concentrations and correlations. And we missed out on a thing called convexity, which is actually banks writing insurance policies. And those three Cs went wrong. And we didn't really, we didn't have the common sense to look for them beforehand. But also, we were looking elsewhere. We, 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 looked, we looked for credit risk, but not in AAA rated securities. So in AAA rated securities, which were high yielding, should have been a red flag, turned into very poor securities. We then thought about applying credit risk standards to them. So we, we, we didn't apply common sense. And what banks, I think, I'd like to hope do today, are much better managed, to some extent overmanaged, still very timid, but we apply a lot of common sense. We, we, we ask ourselves what could go wrong. And I'm a big fan of regulating banks by testing them for stress, by using a whole variety of scenarios. It's much better than that arithmetic approach to, to backward-looking capital and liquidity measures. Much better to stress the institution in all, in all manners, including general operational risk. And, and Richard, please help us here with the Newtonian mechanics of convexity as acceleration and the, the, the second uh, derivative. Can the future of finance be, as David has mentioned, 
and avoid those shocks, which can be ugly convexity. Well, uh, let, let's, let's put the sort of complicated words to one side for a second, because I think, uh, just going back to the, to the comments just now about complexity, I don't believe that innovation means, has to mean increased complexity. And I think right now, the zeitgeist, to go back to that word, is about innovation that brings more simplicity and more transparency. And transparency is really important. It's really important to our customers. It's really important to our regulators. I think the challenge that we have when it comes to responding to shocks is that on the capital side, the financial system is regulated towards cap the maximum capital to withstand the worst shock. Whereas on the profit side, the regulation points us to the least possible profit that it's acceptable to earn at the best possible point in the market cycle. And I think therein lies the tension. Mm -hmm. And we need to bring those back together so that we truly get some degree of counter -cyclical, cyclicality around both capital and profit, at the same time packaging it in transparency and simplicity and understandability. And I think we're still searching for that. But I think that is what regulation and indeed our customers are pushing us mm -hmm. towards. It's just really difficult to do that across a large, complex, legacy-bound industry. A question, please. In the back, please. Can we get a microphone, please, before we launch into the question? Are you on investment is exploding. Is Carlisle investing more and more in FinTech? We are. Um, we do it through growth companies. Uh, we, we don't, we're not a venture investor, but we do it through growth companies, which are companies that have some revenue and maybe in some cases some earnings. And, and those tend to be uh, you know, uh, higher risk investments, but not as risky as, as pure venture capital. And then we do buyout in, uh, investments that are fintech as well. And I think uh, this is probably one of the fastest growing areas of the, of the private equity world, which is financial technology uh, related investments. And they've worked out pretty well for us and for others as well. I suspect you'll continue to see that. Uh, and also, a lot of that money is now being invested in the emerging markets, China and India, mm -hmm. India in particular, a place where we're seeing a lot of fintech investment. Are those investments that capture market share and take greater revenues, or can they actually now, five years out, David, 10 years out, actually provide ample margin? Well, there, there are two things that we're investing in and other people like us. One is things that are helping banks and insurance companies make themselves more efficient and uh, and services are uh, provided more quickly, and therefore they're not disrupting them so much, they're making them maybe more effective, and then things that are completely disrupting those markets. And I don't know which one was gonna be more profitable in the end, but we, we are investing mm -hmm. in both as other people are doing. And I, I do think one of the nationalist points I wanted to uh, pick up on that was mentioned earlier, I don't think that uh, countries like to have no major bank in their country. So I think Deutsche Bank is gonna be prominent in Germany for a long time, and, the, and if it needs support, I think the government will provide it, though it doesn't say it doesn't need any support uh, from the government. But I, I don't think France is going to get rid of having some of its major banks, and England will have some of theirs. But now as we get new financial service companies like Alipay, or, or companies that are not really uh, based in, let's say, Germany or France or England or the United States, will the regulators allow and will the politicians allow all the payment systems to be done out of India or China and companies that are not really based in, let's say, the major company country where some of the services are being provided. I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's an issue that people will have to address. So, for example, will American politicians be happy to have all the payment systems uh, be run by uh, companies that are based in China? I don't know. Maybe they mm. will, maybe they won't. <laughs> Martin, not this please. administration. <laughs> Yeah. So Tom, I, I just wanted to add something on uh, the disruptive uh, type of investments. Um, in, in, our, in our industry, for example, we're testing um, expert system to handle claims. Now, this is completely changing the speed and the quality of the claims processes and services to the customers. Um, if uh, companies will not adapt to this, this will be disruptive. So there will be no other choice than go in that direction and invest and transform. Otherwise, in a couple of years, the companies who will not do that, so they will be just out of market, right? And so I think it's much more pervasive than uh, what we uh, have heard so far. Technology is changing the way we work, it's changing the services we give to customers. 
and the companies who will not adapt to the to, to right. these changes will be out. Do you just assume within capital allocation, labor allocation, total factor productivity, whatever you want to call it, multi-factor productivity, that there'll be fewer bodies at Zurich? I don't mean to pin you down on some silly tactical question, but do you just assume fewer employees is the first order solution when you use technology? So um, in the last 10 years, uh, the total number of employees in the financial sector, banks and insurance has been flat, despite the growth of middle class and despite the emergence of new players and new opportunities to work. Um, every um, forecaster says that there is roughly 50% of jobs that will be replaced by computers over the next 10 years. So yes, right. there will be fewer jobs. Can brief us here on this absolute mystery, the, I call it the Dale Jorgensen mystery of productivity. It's really front and center in every single conversation, isn't it? Well, I think um, there's a measurement issue that we don't know because GDP was designed to measure things, and now 75 or 80 percent of GDP is services, which you don't measure as well. Uh, there's also the financial crisis, which, uh, which Cloud thinks. I wanted to mention something about the national boundaries. So a big problem in the financial crisis was that the multinational banks, it wasn't very easy to unwind them because they had you know, cross-border holdings. Mm -hmm. The US didn't want to pay for banks in Mexico, et cetera. So m many regulators arrived at the solution. You had to sort of have a, uh, each bank incorporated separately in each country. But the modern finance absolutely wants global players. There's very natural synergies. There are natural oligopolies in, in this. And I don't know how we resolve that. Europe couldn't resolve it. Look how much trouble they had with their bailing out their banks. And theoretically, the Eurozone had everything in place to allow this to work mm -hmm. seamlessly. So there's a big political problem going forward how we do this, that finance wants to be international, as Anne said. And yet the political system just doesn't come close to having a mechanism with, for dealing with it. With the heritage of Deutsche Bank at Frankfurt in London and with your US facilities and, and, and frankly worldwide, what is your optimal regulation given being a multinational bank? What is your best outcome given the nationalism that we've been talking about? Well, it's a good question. We're in the eye of the storm because we are fundamentally an international bank. Um, mm -hmm. We're rooted in Germany, that's our, it's our core market, but um, the markets we really serve are international markets. And we're at our best in international banking and international um, capital markets. And Ken's absolutely right, of course, um, there's been a balkanization of, um, mm -hmm. of regulation, particularly in relation to liquidity. And so even though, where we don't have to f physically incorporate, we run a branch as though it were incorporated effectively, and so we look at the combined operations in each of the major booking centers and jurisdictions. Of course, we have um, remote booking, so we originate business in one jurisdiction and book it somewhere else. That's a matter of tremendous convenience to our clients. For example, we, we contract with um, thousands and thousands of institutions out of our London <coughs> branch, and they, they deal with Deutsche Bank right. London branch, and that's it, they're done globally. So it's a huge convenience. It allows us to net effectively but it's not, well, it's not really comfortable with current regulation. With seven minutes to go in our panel, let me ask the dumb question of the panel, and this comes off the inside of Dr. Weber and the capital markets. Do you need people there within the technology and innovation of the future of finance? Do you still need someone on the watch? I, um, who did I talk to? With David Folkert's Landau the other day. Michael Lewis, who for years did your commodity research and now is working on sustainable uh, energy. Do you need a Michael Lewis on the watch in Tokyo? We absolutely do need people. Um, you we, still do? We need that common sense that comes yeah. with people. And the more complex our algorithms get, the, the less safe those algorithms are because they're harder to, to monitor. Um, now, we have a man mantra internally that we, exactly as Mario said, we need to replace a lot of people who are actually performing the function of the computer. So our mantra is to stop people using their hands and eyes and start using their brains. We upscale the work. People add much more value. And we get computers to, to automate um, what we hope will be much more standardized business. That doesn't mean we don't provide solutions to clients, but we provide them in a modular way 
where we can, we, can, we can identify individual building blocks and we authorize them for use together. Mm -hmm. And that makes us much simpler and it helps us be regulated because we've made ourselves simpler. Um, but trust jurisdictional business rem will remain. The world will mm -hmm. remain um, a place where trade takes place and banks need to support that. Well, this leads to Prime Minister May. We've got the quotes in uh, released uh, on her speech today. Here they are. We want, this is from Prime Minister May, and I believe her speech that we'll hear this morning. We want to buy your goods, sell you ours, trade with you as freely as possible. I mean, David Rubenstein, that's as simple it is about a Washington consensus and a system that seemed to work. Well, um, it's easy to make these statements, and of course, it's, it's uh, desirable that, that all those wonderful things would happen, but the reality is uh, more complex. Uh, one of the wonderful things about financial technology is that it will make everybody have uh, access to financial services and payment systems and credit much more readily than before, and all of that will unfold over the next five and ten years. I think people will be pleased with this, and now you, don't, you, don't, you won't need to carry your credit card, you won't need to carry your wallet. Uh, you won't even need to carry your cell phone because everything will probably be through your fingerprint or your or your eye. But um, we do have greater uh, cyber crime that's likely to occur as well. And a whole variety of things that you can invest in now are things that are going to prevent these kind of cyber crimes. So there's, as you get more and more financial technology and it become more important a part of our life, you're going to find more people who are going to try to get around the system. And I, I encourage mm -hmm. everybody who has some type of financial tech uh, a device or something to make sure that they are, are, are protected and, and make sure that they have taken the steps to, to uh, protect themselves against money being stolen or their identity being stolen because this is increasingly going to be a big problem with the mm -hmm. whole fintech uh, revolution. Let us, uh, in the final minutes that we have, move to uh, the moment we have in, in the United States inauguration, I believe it's on Friday, and these other key elections in Europe. Um, as well, Ken Rogoff, is it a, are we moving towards with the tensions and the anger and the other panels here at the World Economic Forum, the rage of the day? Are we moving towards a zero-sum world? Are we moving back to mercantilism, away from all accomplished from the Atlantic Charter? I mean, Harold James at Princeton has a great book he wrote actually just around the financial crisis about the waves in globalization and history and how it comes and go, their ebbs and flows. And he predicted, I think it was a 25-year downtrend starting from that point. And there are clearly a lot of very strong, you know, populist reactions, and you know, we're seeing them all over the world. I don't. No, it's not a zero sum. You listen to someone like Donald Trump, and you think it's a zero sum, but it is not a zero sum. Uh, globalization, trade can work for everyone, etc. But we're we're in a period where we're going the other way. But I don't think it'll just slow growth. I think people who mm -hmm. have low income, middle income, they will suffer from higher prices. Right. And help us here with the actuarial assumption. If we have a Trump reflation, if we have a new reflation with fiscal stimulus, et cetera, et cetera, can you lift up the return expected from investing and through finance? Um, look, I think, I think if you look at um, the capacity for intelligent investment. There is scope for the business sector, for the corporate sector, to put in a lot of productive growth. And I am an optimist about the fact that technology, clearly there are some losers out of it. But at the end of the day, every great technological leap forward has ultimately been to the benefit of the mm -hmm. aggregate economy. What we've not been good at, and I think this is, this is always the case, is that we look at averages and we say, on average, everyone is better off. And we don't think enough about mm -hmm. the tails and the extremes. And that's really what a lot of the conversation this week, I think, will be about. We need to get better at that. But look, I think this net-net, again, go roll forward 15 years and look back. We will see this as a marvelous period of innovation. And people who aren't doing some stuff today, ultimately, that time that is freed up. Humans are really good about finding other useful stuff to do useful, innovative stuff. And so as an optimist, I think, um, you know, I think actually there's a lot equities might do okay from here, to go back to your very simple question. John Cryan, Mario Greco, Ann Richards, Kenneth Rogoff, David Rubenstein, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.